Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone across the Zoom down and around the world. Again, you are welcome to the third event in the African Literature Association's lecture series for the 2021-22 academic year. My name is Akin Adeshokan. I teach comparative literature and cinema and media studies at Indiana University, Bloomington. And it's been my pleasure to coordinate this series with my colleagues in the Executive Council of the Association, including Matt Brown of the University of Wisconsin at Madison and James Coco, James McCocko, excuse me, of William and Hubbard College in Geneva, New York. This series began last year as an initiative suggested by the immediate past president, Girmine Negash of Ohio State University, and it's a continue to receive the support of the Executive Council this year, particularly of the current president, Mohamed Karama Kamara of Washington and Lee University, who is a co-organizer of this series and very active uh, to get it going. The most accurate thing to say about the series is that it's a collaborative work. Also, we'd like to acknowledge the continued support of other members of the council, as well as the larger membership of the association. Due to your continued attention and attendance, the series has come to be regarded in the past year as a publicly engaged feature of the association's presence in this age when public engagement is roughly equivalent to be socially or civically responsive and digitally audible and visible when and where connections are stable. Thank you, everyone. We have typically held this event on the third Saturday of every month. Due to the scheduling issues around the Thanksgiving holidays last week, we decided to hold our very first December event and early enough in the month. Today's lecture, Authors Speak, African Migrations, follows the format we adopted in October, which featured two presenters appearing at once and which we pulled off as a great success from the feedback we have received since then. The difference is that our presenters today, C.V. Kande and Benjamin Kwachi, are creative writers whose work to be featured as significant for being about African migrations in very specific ways. In his presidential address at the end of the 2021 annual conference of the association, Mohamed Kamara observes, and I quote him, over the past decade or so, a new kind of literary, artistic, and cinematographic practice has been emerging. One that focuses in part or in whole on a specific aspect of the migrant experience. This representation of the African migrant focuses on the journey, even as it acknowledges the point of departure, the home as locus of original disaster and trauma, and the point of arrival, the tantalizing west or north. This is about the in-between spaces. What happens on the high seas of the Mediterranean or on the sand dunes or shifting sands of the Sahara or the Kalahari, or in the forests of tropical Africa? This is the twilight zone or the clear of school space time of experience where the migrant is torn between the past and the future, but holding both together or being held together by both precariously, almost like Sankofa. It is out of a desire to illuminate this aspect of the literature of migration that we have turned to our two authors today. They will both speak, they will both but separately offer ideas about their work in this respect. And we do so, uh, and we also do our audience the honor of reading short excerpts from their work. We're going to start with C.V. Kande. C.V. Kande is a Franco-Senegalese historian, and she specializes in the complex conversation between Africa and Europe, and Africa and its diasporas. She's the author of uh, Threats, Urbanism, and uh, an Architecture, excuse me, uh, the author I'm translating now of Earth, Urbanism, and Creole Arch Architecture in Sierra Leone from the 18th to 19th century, published by Lamatan in 1998, and the editor of Discourse on Metisage, Metisage Identity, A Quest for a Real, published by uh, Lamatan in 1999. She's also the author of three collections of poetry published by Gallimard, including The Unending Quest for the Other Shore, 
which is forthcoming from Wesleyan University Press. It is translated, an English translation by Alexander Eco is forthcoming from Wesleyan University Press. I suspect that she will read from this volume and I hope she doesn't prove me wrong. A member of Pen America and the Association of the Louis Legrand uh, Lycée, CV teaches African studies in the SUNY Old Westbury History and Philosophy Department. She is a member of the Honorary Committee of the World Foundation for Memoria Gore Amadis and the Preservation of Gore Island in Senegal. Over to you, CV. Good morning, good morning. Thank you. Let me thank uh, Mohamed uh, Kamara and Akin uh, Adesokan wholeheartedly for the invitation to participate uh, in this round table that they extended to me on behalf of the African Literature Association. It is a, a great honor and a true pleasure uh, to be back among ALA uh, members and to have uh, Ben Kwaki as a co panelist. Uh, it is wonderful to have an opportunity to present my forthcoming uh, work and I will do so with the permission of uh, Wesleyan uh, Press and uh, Alexander Dickow, the translator. Greeting to all listeners. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, this uh, invitation comes at a, at a juncture where my uh, neo-epic poem, as I call it, uh, La Quête Infinie de l'Autre Rive, The Never-Ending Quest for the Other Shore, uh, first published in French by Gallimard in uh, 2016, has acquired new lives, so to say. And this, thanks to two wonderful translators, both poets in their own right, they approached me upon reading La Quête, uh, which brought us together and sealed our friendship. Uh, Tim Shaskalik enabled my poem to reach a German speaking readership who revealed to be very receptive. And with the forthcoming publication of Alexander Dickau's translation, my poem will now have an Anglophone audience. Um, and I rejoice. Uh, it is really, um, it really is a dream coming true for a writer such as myself, who is uh, firmly anchored uh, in a specific language, uh, French uh, for that matter, yet who writes, as uh, Glissant once put it, in the presence of all languages of the world. The ability some of the translators, such as Tim or Alex, uh, have uh, to convey not only the content and uh, the message of the source text, but also the aesthetic research that informs it, is, in my opinion, nothing short of miraculous. Uh, the question that they had pertained to aspects of African culture uh, that I evoked or that I reworked uh, in the poem, and understandably, some expression in the old French I use, and I will uh, come back to that uh, very soon. Uh, look, as artificial as it may seem, uh, let me begin with the beginning and uh, attempt uh, to describe the thrust uh, that drove the poem into existence. Maybe I could be so bold as to refer to its genesis. For truly, in the beginning, was the emotion. When I read articles and saw pictures of migrants uh, landing more dead than alive on European shores, pictures of empty or capsized boats they had embarked on, I felt the pangs of a massive injustice and a deep horror. Migration, just like food security, is a human right, as Catherine Vitol de Vanden reminds us in a pamphlet that should be translated and widely distributed. All the migrants who, reach, who attempt to reach Europe by boat are not Africans, as the tragic fate recently met by 27 persons in the English Channel indicates. But for African migrants, it is as if history was replicating one of its most somber 
pages by piling the bodies of the young on top of those elders who never completed the middle passage on their way to the Americas. And yet my sense of outrage was directed not only against cool border policies and the laws of the global market, but also against the newspapers or the web too often miserabilist representation of those travelers whose enterprise was uh, seen through a socio-economic prism only. They are poor coming uh, without permission to the wealthy corners of the world. As it happened, uh, I had almost completed a series of readings in preparation for an essay on medievalism in Amadou Kuruma's novels, when I came across an amazing interview, as I call it, uh, related uh, by the Arab historian Al Umari. Uh, it is a, a transcribed uh, alleged conversation uh, that took place between the famous Mansa Musa and the governor of Cairo, who uh, taking advantage of the Malinke emperor's pilgrimage uh, to Mecca, begged of him to explain, among other things, uh, how he became uh, to be the political leader of the Mali Empire. Mansa Musa's response uh, was that his predecessor, uh, Mansa Abu Bakr II, refused to believe that there was nothing beyond the horizon. And that, and that he left one day with 1,000 boats for him and his men and 1,000 more for food and water. And this anecdote can be um, found in the corpus of early Arabic sources for the West African history by uh, Levitian. This was clearly an epiphany for, moment for me. I was struck by the poetry of Abu Bakr's words, still vibrant across so many translations, so many quotations, and so many centuries. I was struck by the flamboyant confidence of a man who left everything behind just to decipher the elsewhere. Of course, I was mindful that this interview is apo apocryphal and cannot be taken as an historical source. But what a treasure for a poet. The absence of archive uh, allowed me to deploy my creativity in imagining the main characters, the circumstances, and various versions of the medieval ma maritime expedition, its conflicting goals and consequences. And I had right there everything I needed to present the contemporary migrants as the real heroes of today's human, humankind, who fearlessly dare cross the ocean on fragile boats in, in search of knowledge, other shows and other people in search of their own truth as well. So I, would, um, I decided to create a game of mirrors in which the contemporary voyages of African migrants would reflect the medieval expeditions of Mansa Abu Bakr and vice versa. The structure of my poem espouses this agenda. The first canto is devoted to Mansa Abu Bakr and his mysterious expedition, a double expedition, as a matter of fact, because uh, it was launched twice, uh, uh, according to Al Omari. Uh, I imagined uh, that it ended up as a wreck and that the poem uh, was uh, aimed at celebrating this dazzling defeat in line with one of the definitions of epic given by Glissant. As my purpose was not to de deliver the truth on this matter, I envisioned other versions of the expedition, other faces of Abu Bakr, who became a multifaceted hero and anti-hero simultaneously. This is the object of the second canto. 
The third canto that could uh, easily be read first uh, if one wanted um, to is a, is a com contemporary crossing of the sea, the suffering endured by the passengers, the interpretation they share among themselves of their voyage. Their rescue by boat that could be uh, that could have been launched by uh, Frontex, uh, you know, this agency in charge of border management, uh, as uh, the expression goes, and the victory of uh, Ulysses, who manages to get ashore, maybe to return to a place he was deported from previously. Thus, uh, my poem is the fruit of emotion and trace, theoretical and literary readings, and of the fortuitous encounter uh, and their fortuitous encounter uh, in my mind one day. Or maybe not so fortuitous after all. Uh, I'm conscious uh, that as a reader and interpreter of my own work, I developed a posteriori uh, a discourse around it that cannot account for both uh, for, for, for the, 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 the thundering and cunning aspect of creation. Uh, in any case, I set out first to write a fictional prose narrative, just because this is the ultimate challenge for me. Um, but as I was writing, I noticed that the clauses uh, turned into verses, words began to echo each other, to rhyme on occasions. Uh, moreover, it appeared to me that the rhythm evoked that of paddles. I could hear the, the waves crashing. The breath became oceanic. I was embarked. Embarked in an epic poem, which was exactly the form I needed to emphasize the migrant's heroism. Once I recognized the, the genre uh, of what I had just begun to sketch, I could avail myself to of a, of a huge library of epics. Some of them, such as Homer's work or La Chanson de Roland, are very well known, others much less so, in spite of the work done by the likes of Liliane Kestelut, Basirou Dieng, or Isidore Ocpeo. I read this corpus extensively to feed on what I would call the spirit of epic, its representation of the world, its language, notably its formulaic disposition. I was particularly interested by uh, epic poems created by corporations such as the West African Hunter, uh, because my poem is about people who migrate. Because of the quasi ubiquitous nature of uh, an antagonism between good and evil, the frequent exaltation of belligerence and the glorification of toxic mas masculinity in, uh, in uh, epic text, I had to mark my distance with those values. And I did so uh, both by inserting parodic renditions of, the, of such texts, as well as putting strong, independent women in my boats. I, went, uh, I, I even went as far as making one woman the griot of the Malinke emperor in charge of keeping the memory of his maritime deeds. Uh, this is the reason why I like to define uh, La Quête Infinie de l'Autre Rive, the never ending uh, quest for the other show, as a neo epic poem. I could as well have said a post epic poem uh, now that I think of it. Uh, two major, major uh, issues I faced uh, while writing uh, this poem had to do with language. And first of all, how to build those world, uh, worlds in uh, French, uh, since I was not going to write in Malin Malinke, a language I unfortunately do not uh, possess. Uh, so I relied uh, on uh, Africanized French when necessary, but not 
not always, um, I um, uh, settled for equivalence and I settled for a manner of looking at the, at the world that seems to me uh, more appropriate. I also decided to use older forms of French to give the poem the patina it needed to be associated with a medieval context in the first and second canto, a suspension of disbelief helping. And uh, in, in so doing, uh, of course, I didn't make uh, the work of my translators any easier, uh, but uh, I also discover in the process a number of correspondences that are unfortunately understudied. Uh, for instance, I uh, discovered that there was a word uh, en parlier in old French uh, to say griot. This is the spoke person of, um, of uh, 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 a ruler, a person of importance. Um, so in this poem, as in the rest of my uh, fictional work, I'm extremely sensitive to the oral quality of the text I produce. Uh, so literally I recited the poem as I was writing it and I changed everything that didn't sound harmonious or dissonant, um, uh, but adequate in any case uh, to the specific effects uh, I wanted uh, to create. And that was my, my attempt also to reintroduce uh, in the poem the performative dimension of, uh, of the, uh, the epic. I will conclude uh, by adding that it was gratifying to notice that the publication of uh, La Quête Infinie de l'Autre Rive generated a lot of debates around the epic genre and that, that, that all of a sudden uh, this genre didn't seem as obsolete as it had appeared and could be traced in a number of works of uh, fiction, uh, The Notebook of a Return to My Native Land, of course, by Césaire, uh, Le Devoir de Violence by Yambo Wologem, who has uh, been fully uh, rediscovered with the granting of the Goncourt Prize to Mohamed Bougar uh, Sarr. Uh, so um, I will uh, now uh, read uh, just uh, an excerpt, uh, both in French and in um, in English, um, uh, to give you an idea of uh, of the of the poem. Uh, so um, uh, French first. Il rame désormais sans chanson ni an. Depuis combien de temps? savoir combien de saisons. Depuis combien dit le mirage apporté par les vents ramait-il repu de roulis et gavé d'embrun Mémoire brouillée de ce que c'est que d'avoir les pieds sur terre et paupières en chamade. Il ne se soucie plus à présent que de la vague qui va, se dérobe et revient. Paysans qui sur le tard s'étaient fait marin ils cadencent leur corps pour fendre de la pointe gâtée de l'aviron les mottes violettes de la grande savane salée que nul sillon ne marque ou nulle semence ne lève, mais à dire la mer peut siérer les mots de la terre. Au point de ce rêve, ils étaient une myriade, ni plus ni moins, qui passèrent en riant la barre de corail et ses fleurs vermeilles n'en reste que trois barques en dérade, pleines, mais pleines à chavirer. And, um, I will now read uh, Alex, Alexander Dickow's um, translation. And uh, bear with me uh, because of my accent. Um, Ever since they row songless, no heave, Oh, for how long, how to know, how many seasons, how many marriage islands the wind will sow, did they roll past pitch drunk and swollen with pin drift, a foggy memory of what it is to have one's feet on the ground and eyelids fluttering, they heed nothing at present, but the wave that goes, slips away and returns. Country folk who made themselves belated mariners, their bodies cadenced them to cleave with the oar-tented tip, 
the purple mounds of the great salt savanna, which no furrow marks, where no seed takes root, but to say the seed, earthly words are little suited. At the point of this dream, there were a myriad, no less and no more, to cross the coral barrier in laughter with, with its vermilion flowers. There remain but three bogs adrift, full, so full, to the point of capsizing. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, we'll now turn to our next uh, speaker. Uh, that's uh, Benjamin Kwachi, born in Accra, Ghana. Uh, Benjamin Kwachi is the author of several works of fiction and poetry. He holds degrees from Dartmouth College and Harvard Law School. His latest novel, The Obsession of Paradise, is the 2021 winner of the African Literature Association's Book of the Year Award for Creative Writing. His other awards include the Regional Commonwealth Writers Prize for Best First Book, the Regional Commonwealth Writers uh, for Best, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, the IPPY Gold Award for Adult Multicultural Fiction. His novel, The Clothes of Nakedness, has been adapted for radio as a BBC play of the week. Kwachi's poetry has appeared in numerous publications and anthology. He is a director of the Africa Education Institute. Uh, you're welcome to unmute and show your face, sir. Okay. All right, good morning. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, depending on where you are. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. I also take this opportunity to thank the ALA for offering me this platform and for the opportunity to say a few words about African migrations. In particular, I thank the ALA executives, Dr. Akin Adesukan and the president of the ALA, Dr. Kamara, and also Dr. Brown, and I also am honored to share this platform with my distinguished co-presenter, Dr. Sylvie Kande. Thanks once again. So I intend to approach the subject of African migrations from the point of view of a writer of fiction. And the reason for this is simple enough. I am a writer of fiction. So my comments are not necessarily rooted in scholarly work or analysis, but rather in observation and sometimes in sheer imagination. That said, I do not think the, this approach of viewing things from a, a fictional perspective renders it any less valid. In fact, I would dare say that fiction sometimes brings us closer to reality than scholarly work. And fiction also enables us sometimes to be more inspiring than nonfiction, limited only by the constraints of our imagination. So long as we are cognizant of fiction's own limitations in this regard, in that the imagination is susceptible in certain cases to detachment from a reality in a way that can be unuseful, except perhaps for entertainment. At the same time, fiction that takes its inspiration from fact, also called faction, as mine often does, provides us with the best of both worlds. On the one hand, a rootedness in reality, that keeps us grounded. And on the other hand, a kind of, a kind of flightiness in pushing towards or in pushing boundaries that allow us to challenge the status quo as well as to inspire. Inspiration for action, inspiration to achieve and so on. So with that as a background, let me raise the question, the fundamental question, why? Why even talk about migration? I mean, well, at a very personal level, this is a matter of importance to me, and I believe many of us, because I am a migrant myself, having migrated to the U.S. from Ghana, initially for college and subsequently attending law school, and for some time now as a working lawyer. And I believe that many of us are migrants or live and work with migrants or no migrants. So in one form or another, whether we like it or not, 
our lives are impacted by migrants, in many cases, African migrants. But beyond the personal interest, I think opening our eyes to migration does a few things. First, by discussing it for what it really is, we can debunk many falsehoods or misconceptions. And in the process, humanize the migrant beyond the cliches and caricatures we sometimes encounter in the media. If we pay attention to the media, Africa and its children are often mischaracterized and in extreme cases, even dehumanized. Second, and related to the dispelling of falsehoods and misconceptions, is presenting multi-dimensional human needs. In other words, fully realized characters or people, no matter the circumstance of their migration, that helps create empathy for the migrant. I call it putting flesh and blood on and in the migrant so that he or she is a walking human being as anyone else with common and divergent interests as the next person. Third, and depending on the reason for migration, presenting a picture of the migrant, even in, fictional, in a fictional setting, can help paint a realistic picture that may serve as a guide or a tale of caution to those who are inclined to believe that the grass is always greener on the other side, or that they will find a land flowing with milk and honey if they can make it to that other side often fed misleading stories by media and even acquaintances who are wont to paint rosier pictures than is actually the case. And that brings me now to the reasons for migration, African migration that is. And, and my list is not necessarily exhaustive, but here is what I see and what I have represented in my fictional work. So no, number one is seeking opportunity, experience, or even adventure, often with the hope of returning home after a brief period. So this kind of migrant usually belongs to the elite of society and intends to return home and assist with nation building. And I think this was particularly true in the colonial and immediate post-colonial period when many Africans went abroad to see the UK or France, and in some cases, Russia and elsewhere to study. And many did indeed return home and got involved in various aspects of society. There are countless lawyers and doctors, for example, who fit this category. And we can see this when we look at the African leaders in the immediate post-colonial period yeah, and their resumes like Sengal went to the Sorbonne, University of Paris, Nyerere was at the University of Edinburgh, uh, Balewa was at the UCL Institute of Education, Kama at um, Oxford, Nkrumah at Lincoln University, University of Pen Pennsylvania, and so on. And this is an experience I try to capture in my novel, The Other Crucifix, which chronicles the experiences of a Ghanaian migrant in the US through college and law school in the 1960s, and his sense of alienation in a foreign land that is sometimes welcoming and sometimes just outright uh, hostile. Number two, escaping economic difficulties. My guess is that the bulk of African migration these days falls in this bucket. In this case, the migrant is faced with economic difficulties or a sense that they can do better elsewhere and they migrate with the hope of living better lives themselves and of providing a better future for their families. This category of migrant usually fails to achieve their intended purpose and gets caught in a cycle of living from hand to mouth or even worse, barely able to make ends meet. And that the weight of expectations plays on them by the reality of their circumstances and the needs of family and friends at home, many of them are likely unwilling or unable to return home. And I explore this kind of migrant in the Count's Falls Banquet in which count Tutu leaves Ghana for the US and soon finds out that the banquet he expects to feast from is hardly existent for those of his ilk and that he has to struggle mightily just to make ends meet. Despite his education and intelligence, he is forced to take on menial jobs just to survive and sometimes barely. Number three, there are those who are forced by internal turmoil and conflict or even political persecution to flee their homelands. And writers are not spared. 
So we have prominent names like Ngugi and Shoinka and Brutus who face this. And this is a theme I tackle in the three books of Shama, in which Shama Rugwe leaves Rwanda after the genocide, migrating to the US where she overcomes enormous obstacles and by sheer determination and excellence is nominated to the US Supreme Court and then all hell breaks loose. This novel is in some ways aspirational in that it suggests what is possible, even if it comes at great cost. And in some instances, perhaps the exception than the rule, the African migrant makes it to the top of their professions in their adopted homes. Of course, the name that readily comes to mind is Obama. And while he is not a migrant per se, he is the offspring of one, even if his father was a transitory migrant. And then we have people like Representative Omar, Mo Ibrahim, who spent some time in Egypt and England. And then there are countless African writers like Ben Okri, who have shot to prominence while living away from their native countries. So as is evident from my discussion so far, I have focused on migrations outside of Africa, but there's also internal migration. That is Africans leaving one African country for another African country. It seems this is currently the dominant form of migration on the continent. And the reasons for such migration are not that different from those I have already discussed. For this type of migration, one would assume that the migrant has an easier time as an African living in another African country. But while this may be so sometimes, it is not always the case. And we have examples of hostility by Africans towards their fellow Africans. There is no denying that the citizens of some African countries see one another as brothers and sisters. But this mutual affection notwithstanding, their citizens have been expelled from sister countries under circumstances that leave much to be desired. And in other African countries, we have seen violence visited on Africans by other Africans. And I explore this fraternal hostility somewhat in my most recent novel, Obsessions of Paradise, where people from various parts of Africa migrate to Libya with the hope of ultimately reaching Italy and in the process encountering a number of atrocities at the hands of fellow Africans. So what I haven't explored in much in my fiction, but which is probably happening much more these days is Africans who have spent long periods outside returning to their homelands for one reason or another, including improved circumstances back home, or simply getting tired living as migrants abroad and hoping to return to the home they left. After all, as they say, home sweet home. So in conclusion, I think when we look at the story of the African migrant, we find that he or she is seeking what anyone else would seek in similar circumstances, primarily in seeking to better their lot in life. Human beings who, who want to be human beings, capable of achieving much and of failing woefully. And appreciating this better will hopefully move us to a better place of understanding and empathy. And in this era of increased globalization, I expect the trend of African emigration to continue with its attendant brain drain and brain of skilled labor. But at the same time, with some African countries making appreciable studies, I also expect reverse migration to accelerate. And I see this in my, my native Ghana. I see a lot of Ghanaians who've lived and in some cases done quite well abroad, moving back to Ghana, some to retire, and others to set up businesses. And then there are those who have their feet in both worlds, spending some of their time on the continent and some of it outside the continent, as the world has indeed become a global village. And you know, with, the, uh, with the explosion of the internet and social media, a time is coming and perhaps the time is now, or perhaps came long ago, when we will no longer, or we no longer may think of migration solely as physical relocation, but also as a mental or psychological migration, where people may be located in one country, but are mentally living in another, and indeed can virtually experience living outside the continent, can experience 
living outside the continent uh, as though they were living somewhere else, somewhere else. And if the coronavirus has taught us one thing, it is that you don't have to be physically present in any one particular place to perform tasks. So you can work for an American company while living in Africa. So with that, that said, I, mean, I, I would like to just read a couple of brief passages from a couple of my novels, starting with the um, other crucifix, which is the first of a trilogy of Afri my African migration that I wrote. And in the passage that I read, um, the protagonist, jo Jojo Bedou, is reflecting on his choices after he has been in the US for a while. Thoughts of home would nag me. Years after my arrival, questions would abide, casting a long specter of doubt. What if I'd stayed in Ghana? land of my breath, embodiment of my past. What if I had gone to Ghana law school, married a Ghanaian woman, bred children who spoke as Santi and swam in the same waters as I, recognized the same landmarks as I did and my forebears before me? What if I'd established my practice, my practice there, aged without a sense of abandonment, rattling as chains on my heels, and canvas perhaps for a political office or two. The road not taken. I do not remember thee with just a sigh, as though you were a potential simply submerged in the success of the road taken. But even success is a loaded word. For I have bitten my chest like a madman and yelled at the foregone possi possibilities, held between the reality of today and the receding unreachable past. I have yelled like a lunatic at the inconclusiveness of my choices. In a way, the road not taken became a dream that never was, a suspension of tomorrow that because of its lack of fulfillment came with considerable regret. Perhaps that isn't bad after all. A life without regret implies a perfect life or one without ambition, lived too glibly without trial and growth. But at the same time, a life filled with regret is a sad one, even depressing perhaps. That is from the other crucifix. And the next reading is taken from the second book in, in the trilogy. And that is the three books of Shama, in which Shama migrates to the US after facing atrocities in, in, um, in, in Rwanda. And she is eventually nominated to the US Supreme Court and these are her thoughts upon her nomination. Backlash or just lash, I will soon find out that the country's breath would stay suspended. And by the time it returned in exhalation, much would have been lost and hopefully gained and the future of the country for some would be considered destined for a bad turn those who believed that I was an assault on everything they believed in, all the traditions, cultural mores, and even religious underpinnings that made America what it was and what they would like it to be. Yell, not yawn, as I had expected. If I could provide them comfort at all, I would have told them to relax. But all things new, even bitter ones, become familiar with time and bitter pill dissolves and joins the bloodstream to heal, eventually providing a cure at the minor expense of a diminishing bitter aftertaste. I'd already heard that some were reading the appointment as part of the president's self-fulfilling diabolical eschatolo eschatological match, a part of its grander scheme to precipitate the end of the world. Although I hadn't known the president to have such ap apocalyptical tendencies, I would have liked to tell them that if it were all to be reconstructed a hundred years later, although I hoped it wouldn't take that long, the reasons why they gasped at the announcement would be unimportant. All I could do was brace myself for the aches to come. I recalibrated the factors I anticipated would raise opposition, none on its own sufficient to derail a nomination, but combined to sit on the highest judicial office, number one, place of birth, Butari, Rwanda, 
gender, female, number two. Third, color, black. A black African woman nomina nominated to sit on the Supreme Court of the United States as its chief justice. Now, was I naive to what issues would be raised about my religious affiliation? Aware what many thought of the president himself, I expected that given my mother's faith, sure to be discussed no matter what I said, I would be cast in some, even in many circles, as a black African Muslim woman. And then finally, I would like to read a short passage from my most recent novel, Obsessions of Paradise, that was recently uh, um, honored by the African Literature Association. So on this one, uh, a group of people have left their homelands and they are traveling across the Sahara uh, to Libya and hopefully eventually to uh, Italy. And here's just a short passage of some of the things that they faced. Then at the next stop, as a group of them st stepped out to urinate, there was no denying it, dead bodies in the desert. There were at least 20 of them lying in different poses, face up on the side, body bent fetal like a total surrender in spread eagle, face down as if afraid to look at death. How could Abdullahi have stopped at that spot? Had he, not, had he not seen the bodies? Don't look, he yelled, don't look. Too late now, Puni whispered to Shem. I wonder what happened to them. Desert get hungry sometimes, Abdullahi said. Eat up people, but it don't rot them. Sand preserve them. Shem wasn't sure if that was a joke or meant for serious consumption. Was the desert some form of being? A spirit perhaps that killed people. Although the desert had not eaten them up in that they, had, they still had their bodies. Or was it an inner body consumption that left the outer body in, intact? Did the desert ocean also have its stories of a mythical creature like Mame Water of the water ocean in which he had bathed so many times? Did the dead bodies telescope their own fate? Death is closer than we think, Puni said. Without vigilance, vig without vigilance, we go sooner than later. It's foolish to rail against death anyway, for we are all dying, and death is our connection to the dead. Are you a philosopher? One man close to Shem and Puni asked. Philosopher of the desert, he added. We all are philosophers of the desert, for we are learning its mind. Puni replied, probably robbed and killed or left stranded by bandits, by bandits, these ones. My name is Chibuzo, he said. Puni, Shem, Nigeria, you? Ghana, Shem said. Ghana man, we're brothers, he said. Don't be afraid, he added. So long as we watch out for one another, we will be okay. Are you traveling alone? Puni asked Chibuzo. Chibuzo pointed to a younger woman, a younger man walking towards the pickup with such briskness that his arms pumped the air. I'm with him, my brother. Eze is his name. They couldn't chat for long as Abdullahi urged them back into the pickup. Thank you for listening. I turn it back to you, Dr. Aki. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um... Quite, uh, quite fascinating listening to both of you. And really thank you for your generosity in sharing your work and really placing them in context. I think this is really very, uh, very useful. It gives us a very uh, expansive, I believe, uh, slate within which to engage some of the issues that you've uh, uh, brought up and uh, really always maybe indirectly articulated in all sorts of ways about migration. So. Uh, listening to both of you uh, really was thinking of trying to find a way of engaging both of you both to start things off. And um, so uh, you be patient with me as I try to uh, to sort of put certain ideas together because it's really quite fascinating, especially uh, starting with uh, CV, talking about Bubaka II. And uh, the interesting thing about that story, and so again, I guess what I'm saying is I'm going to pose a question that both of, both of you can answer. And then I'll go, come to some specific questions for you individually, hoping that in the process of doing these, we'll hear more from the audience and then I'll take a back seat, so to speak. 
All right. So let me uh, start continue with what I was trying to say. That you mentioned uh, CB that the story of um, Abu Bakr that Mansa told the governor of um, Egypt uh, was probably apocryphal. It's uh, actually quite interesting because in his new book, um, uh, Howard uh, French, a journalist, pu published a book I think in October called A Bomb to Blackness, which actually makes a very interesting and engaged case uh, for uh, the dependency of Europe on Africa rather than the other way around. That the very idea of modern, that basically to say that Europe does not exist <laughs> or could not have existed without African resources. I mean, especially starting with the old notion of the, uh, the, the pre period of slavery and how that essentially was what created the wealth uh, for whatever you want to call Europe as such. And so that's the general thing. It's a very interesting book, very big book, and people are already reading it. But he actually started with the story of Abu Bakr. Uh, and uh, so I guess my interesting, my question about that is, and I want to extend, ex, ex, extend that to, uh, to Ben's own presentation, which is to say that the, the story, what I heard, um, the, what the use I think can be made of the story of um, Abu Bakr II, whether it's apocryphal or not, it, I'm interested in, in, the, in the sensibility behind it, which is a quest for experience, for nobility, and uh, beyond, like in, in the book uh, that uh, Ben mentioned, the, the last book he read from, uh, the, the, the three books of Shama, which is about the African elite or creative person who is driven out. The, the way in which that has been heard or has been discussed in African literature is a question of exile, that Shoyinka or Ngugi was exiled by the government of Nigeria or the government of Kenya. But there is, beyond that thematic of exile, there is the more reflexive idea of expatriation, that is the idea of, of being engaged with home, even when you are not there. And I suspect that that's what, uh, in the short passage that I quoted from Mohammed Kamara's uh, presidential speech, was what was he tried to, to, to describe by talking about thinking uh, or facing both ways, Sankofa-like. So the question I'm trying to present to both of you, and we talk to you, uh, you, you can find a way of um, trying to address it is, how do these two stories, like that is the story of Abu Bakr, who, whether he did it or not, and of course, from the story that you read to us, CV, it was unsuccessful because they drowned. And I mean, that's the conclusion we can reach. But there was this desire for, for experience, for, as you said, a quest for the other shore. And again, but the, the interesting thing about that quest is not just to, to go away, is to enrich the self or one's society in whatever way one might uh, imagine both that. So I guess what I'm trying to get you guys, uh, both of you to respond to is the relationship between migration and the idea of at the same time being engaged with home. What in your experience of doing these two works or all the works that you've done with this respect, can you share with our audience about this whole notion of the reflexivity of, of uh, questing for otherness, either by leaving home or by sort of carrying your home with your, uh, uh, within yourself. So I don't know that <laughs> whether I'm fully articulating this, but I guess that that's what one question that I think I can pose to, to get both of you to respond. So as much as possible, if you can respond to this, or if you want me to re-clarify that, I'm happy to do so, okay? Can we start with uh, Sylvie? Is that clear enough, do you think? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's lampid. Um, uh, I think it has to do very much with the post-departure moment. Uh, so what happens after that? Uh, so so um, uh, the, the, the case of uh, Abu Bakr was interesting in the sense that there is no ending to it that, uh, that is pointed to. Uh, he's just like uh, Don Sebastian, you know, uh, living and never be seen again. So it's a, it's a fantastic image that, uh, that you can have of him disappearing behind the horizon. Um, uh, but uh, 
uh, I was not, um, uh, I didn't want to concentrate my, my poem on, 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 on him only. I made of him the spirit of the voyage. I was much more interested in his men and women uh, who, who came along and what they experienced. And uh, so, you know, although he's a fascinating uh, character, um, uh, I uh, worked around the various motivations that, uh, that people may have had, you know, to, uh, uh, to take part in this, uh, incredible, audacious, per perilous uh, enterprise, and beyond that, to sort of interrogate what uh, can motivate contemporary migrants to do so, knowing all the perils associated with uh, with uh, with the with the with the voyage, and uh, and precisely what was missing from uh, much of the journalistic production on that was the sense of honor. Uh, that guide uh, many of the migrants. They migrate for themselves, but they migrate also for the others. Uh, and uh, Ben evoked that, you know, to migrate in order to improve oneself and, and to improve those who uh, were left behind. Um, uh, so, so there is this part of constant uh, thinking of the of of the home, but at the same time, what is what is interesting is, as you were saying at first, you know, the journey itself, and the journey is a transformative experience. Um, uh, so here we have dramatic circumstances in which you know boats are depart without really having any any bearings, any idea of what they they can find on the on the other shore if there is even an other shore. Um, uh, but and the journey itself is uh, is a is a transformative experience for the self, and um, and uh, it is important to pay attention to that. So I um, I insisted a lot on. The, uh, uh, a place that has no landscape, which is which is the ocean, where everything seems to be the same. And I try to see uh, a little bit how people in the in, in the boats could make sense of this uh, absence of uh, of landscape. Um, the the uh, ancillary question is, of course, the return, um, which I uh, didn't uh, evoke directly or you know the uh, less than the departure and the, and the pursuit of uh, of uh, the migration project and uh, the return is obviously not the return to uh, to the same place that one departed from uh, things have changed in the meantime and this is really what uh, you know the, the, my poem was in a way the uh, response to the discourse that uh, President Sarkozy did in Dakar you know saying that you know uh, Africans are not yet in history yes history is changed and uh, you know when you depart you return to a place that is different than the one you you left so I um, and People have changed, and people may uh, even do not recognize uh, the contribution that you wanted to do, and you have to be prepared for that, uh, or feel frustrated, you know. Uh, for uh, or or and and here um, I, I was, uh, for instance, uh, I, I um, explore that uh, that topic. Uh, because, because something very interesting is that, and, and troubling for historians, of course, is that there is no mention in the oral tradition of uh, Abu Bakr the, the second. Okay, I, st I studied all the genealogies of the Malinke uh, emperors, and he's nowhere to to be to be seen. So this is this is strange. So how come? Uh, is it because he didn't exist, or is it because the the griots and the memorialists decided that his enterprise was too foolish uh, to be mentioned? And that there was a kind of censure that happened of this uh, this uncanny uh, move uh, for uh, a Malinke emperor. So um, uh, the people at home in relationship to the migration project is full of tensions. Uh, also, uh, I uh, just to to, to finish. Um, I was wondering even, I, I found uh, some, uh, I managed to connect uh, the date of uh, the alleged departure of Abu Bakr II with periods of drought. Uh, so I, uh, among the motivations, you know, that's a sort of evoked, that's one or three or four uh, verses in the, in the whole epic, but I thought that maybe uh, the, 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 the project of, um, the project of Abu Bakr would have been to go and visit sites sacred sites to bring back the rain. And um, of course, 
that has a link with uh, the environmental uh, issues that we are uh, all encountering today, but that uh, um, uh, the global South experiences in a, in a much more drastic way and that, uh, you know, produce a lot of environmental migrants, right? Uh, so my answer is not so coordinated, but... <laughs> oh, well, it's clear. It's clear and it's actually very helpful because then we know that there are possible reasons for these that actually, again, reinforces what I was trying to suggest, which was the quest itself not being so much for otherness in a very abstract way, but for some kind of self-interested or self-situated you know, uh, situated kind of experience. I mean, if it goes out because of the uh, of the drought and it wants to bring rain back, it's in, in, in quest of the community. So yeah. uh, that's, again, I guess what uh, made it a uh, very uh, useful uh, response. So thank you. Uh, uh, ben, do you want to add uh, to this? Uh, is the question still clear to you? <laughs> I, mean, uh, I, 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 I think so. Uh, okay. I'll make it my own. Okay, <laughs> thank you. But I mean, I just wanted to comment very briefly to, mm -hmm. on, um, you know, this connection between the migrant, at least mentally and home okay. and emotionally, right? I mean, there, I think there are two migrants, two, two, you know, two migrants, voluntary, generally speaking, voluntary and involuntary. Sometimes, you know, the, the same reasons can exist in, you know, one person where, take Mansa Musa, for example. I mean, he's a form of, he, you know, maybe, you know, there was some uh, maybe temporary migration when he did his um, pil pilgrimage to Mecca, right? So what motivated him to do it? It was voluntary in the sense that as a Muslim, he wanted to go to Mecca uh, to do the Hajj, right? At the same time, I think, and I suspect that he also wanted to see the world um, and also to put Mali on the map. So voluntary and involuntary, right? Uh, if you translate this into the modern world, there are, again, voluntary migrants, people who, for whatever reason, could be, as I said before, maybe adventure, education, whatever they go, and they, they come back. And then there's involuntary persecution, you know, just economic difficulties, they travel abroad and they come back. In all instances, I think, unless maybe you leave home very, very early, um, when you're maybe a child, in all instances, there's home always in you. So even as a migrant, there's always that look back, right? And I think most people, there are always exceptions, always have this, like, if you will, for want of a better word, let's say Sankofa, which you had, you know, sort of alluded to, right? Always looking back home. Uh, and for whatever reason, uh, some people return, some people don't. But I think Sylvie did also mention that the place you left is not necessarily the place that you return to. And that is the risk. Uh, although it may not, it may be a, a good risk, but that's a risk, a risk that migrants face when they, um, you know, when they travel outside of their countries. But that connection, I think, is in there always, in that migrants are always, if you will, having a conversation with where they left. Okay. All right. So um, let me, to start with you, uh, Ben, can you say something about the writing of uh, the obsession of, of paradise? Uh, you, from what I heard listening to you and from the way you've talked about it, it's uh, the part of your trilogy that deals with in, what you call inter-African migration. And uh, so I want you to basically stay with this question or extend this, the premise of this question to how you came to write that book. Because when you talk about uh, inter-African migration, and I mean, I haven't read the novel, uh, it's relatively new, but I do intend to make up for that and find it and, and read it. Uh, so uh, perhaps this idea of Africans, from maybe Ghanaians going to Nigeria, Nigerians going to uh, South Africa, that kind of uh, movement. But then there's the earlier, somewhat earlier uh, pattern of a Ghan the Ghanaian historian uh, or philosopher, Willie Abraham, being born in Lagos. Right? I mean, most people didn't know that, that Willie Abraham was born in Lagos and uh, Paulin Hotunji, the Beninois uh, philosopher was born in Ivory Coast in Abidjan. And of course they remain citizens of their respective national uh, countries. So, I mean, is there, I mean, when you came to compose this novel, which of these two kinds of inter-African migration do you find to be more compelling and why? So I'm actually basically trying to get behind your mind in writing this novel. If so you... my, my, the, the reason behind the writing of the novel is not as sophisticated as that. Okay. You know, I, 
and here's what I mean. Literally, this is what happened: is I was watching a, a BBC documentary on this phenomenon where people are leaving home, facing extremely difficult circumstances to go to Libya and to the Mediterranean. Sometimes, you know, they're just atrocities. And in fact, I had to take some of them out. I mean, when I when I read when I wrote um, Obsessions of Paradise, some of them were just too bad that I didn't I didn't feel comfortable uh, putting them in the novel. The novel contains enough atrocities that they face. So when I read this and like thinking, I know I'm a migrant and I know that there are all forms of migration, but what will make people, and being aware of the risks of loss of life and limb, you know, the difficulties they face, what will make somebody, will compel somebody to make this journey? So that is what actually, and once, you know, I mean, you know, as you know, I'm a practicing lawyer, so I, I have a life as a lawyer. And it, it, as I recall, it was a very busy time at work. But once this idea came, why? Why would somebody do this? I had to write it. I had to release it. And this is why, you know, I wrote The Obsessions of Paradise. Um, and so the novel basically really just captures the experiences of people who, you know, are facing very difficult circumstances. And the reason is they want to improve their lives because they feel like at home, um, they have no future. And, and that, that's what compels the, um, you know, a lot of these people to undertake these journeys. So that's what the reason behind the obsessions of paradise. But, <laughs> but uh, I think maybe just to touch a bit more on your question is that, and, but, but that's not what the novel um, addresses is that, you know, we've had inter uh, or intra rather African migration for a very long time and it's taken all forms of, uh, you know, permutations and nuances, right? So it's not surprising to see like, a, a Ghanaian native, a Ghanaian born in um, Nigeria or elsewhere claiming to be Ghanaians. Because I think that the way we we um, see things is it's not really where you're born, but where you are, your parents are from, mm. right? And so you have this, you know, you're Ghanaian regardless of whether or where you're born or you're Nigerian, even if you're born in Ghana or you're born elsewhere, all right? And so you may have culturally, you may culturally be like say a Nigerian, but you're still a Ghanaian, which is a very interesting phenomenon. Okay. All right. Well, um, we'll get back to that, circle back to that in a sense, because I was going to follow up. But uh, there's a question on in the chat, which I'm sure both of you have seen. It's from Mohammed Kamara. And if you haven't, I will just read it. It says, um, Usman uh, Samaseku's documentary, Le uh, Dernier Refuge, The Last Refuge, takes, talks about adventure versus migration. Uh, and basically asking if both of you could speak to this distinction, if there is any between uh, adventure and migration. So uh, since we are with uh, Ben, if uh, Sylvie wants to go first and then we'll come back to Ben. Unfortunately, I do not know the, the documentary. Um, I hope to see. I don't either. But I mean, do you uh, think, do you think even without that, do you yeah, think of a yeah. particular distinction that could be made between these two? Yeah, uh, I think, uh, you know, just a, a gut feeling uh, would be that uh, adventure is the discourse that is put uh, by uh, some migrants on their project, uh, while migration is a, a kind of generic um, Nomination. And it uh, brings to mind the fact that there is a very long tradition of migration uh, in uh, African cultures, as, as we know, uh, in which uh, in West Afri Africa in particular, uh, the youngest is the one who will travel and see the world and bring back, you know, what he has uh, learned, you know, uh, home while the eldest is keeping things uh, in place. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, that explains a number of, um, uh, you know, uh, migrations flow that uh, didn't come as a, just a, an economic um, uh, uh, project, but uh, an economic project combined with this, uh, this tradition. So um, the, the term adventure also uh, suggests uh, for me something that is contained uh, in, in, in the, the title of another um, uh, film called um, Buck Me, uh, the, the, the La Pirogue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so this uh, kind of uh, sense um, uh, desire to go. 
uh, and uh, that an individual overnight uh, uh, sort of gathers uh, his or her energy to accomplish uh, the, 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 the first step into, into the project. And there is, uh, I think the term adventure um, really uh, emphasize, you know, all this uh, stress uh, that is required in beginning to implement a project one has sort of conceived for a long time in uh, in one's mind. Uh, so the, the, those migratory uh, projects, even if they seem to be um, uh, spontaneous, uh, are uh, the result of precisely a community uh, type of uh, thinking, uh, community resources, it's expensive uh, to, to migrate. So uh, this is not the poorest uh, of the world to migrate, but those who have precisely the support of the, the community and at the same time, the desire to serve serve back uh, the community that, uh, that send them, you know, to, uh, to uh, uh, get a solution and get experience and come back with that, with that experience. So uh, the, 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 term, uh, the term adventure would be a, a kind of a labeling of uh, at the, the, you know, the kind of uh, individual decision, the moment of departure, uh, the recall of uh, this long tradition of uh, the youngest one sort of wandering in the world and bringing back uh, what has what he, he or she has learned uh, in the process. Okay. You want to add to that, uh, Ben, or do you want to take a specific well, question addressed to you? I, I think Subi has uh, addressed it fully. So okay. All right. So, but there's a question in the chat that in that case, we still I'd like to hear from you, if we may. Uh, so uh, an audience member who is also a member of the Executive Council of the Association, uh, Pauline, Dr. Pauline Uwakwe asks, uh, thanks, well, she thanks both of you for uh, giving us uh, this uh, uh, event. Uh, and then says, the, uh, the idea of mental migration that was raised by our honorary Dr. Kwachi is an excellent one. Uh, uh, so, what factors are facilitating facilitating this mode of migration, and how does the pandemic feature in this? I don't often get called doctor, so it's, <laughs> it's uh, for today. For the next uh, thirty minutes, I accept the honorary doctorate uh, degree. Okay. You know, I, mean, I as a lawyer, you know, I do have a Jewish doctor, but doctors are not usually referred to as doctor. In any, in, in, in lawyers are not usually referred to as doctor. In any case, I, I, that's a great question, and I think that this is something it's it's been happening for a while. But I think that with with the internet and social media, I think that it's accelerating in in pace, and also with the coronavirus and you know teaching us that you don't have to be physically present to work. Uh, for you know a company or do your work in a certain specific place, right? I mean, I I have I know that I have been working from home since um, March of last year, you know, and I've been doing my work efficiently from home. Um, it doesn't make it any less um, challenging or any less relevant. It's just location. So I think what we see, you know, and we, we've had cultural um, people call it cultural colonialism for a while. But now, if you go to say, let's see, let me use Ghana as an example. A lot of people now have like mobile phones. You know, people could be very poor and somehow a lot of people have mobile phones. They're able to access the internet. They're able to see what's going on around the world. They're able to watch movies um, from around the world, right? And so you have that constant, um, if you will, bombardment of, let, let's say foreigners or foreign things. Uh, and I think that in certain instances, it's creating that um, sort of mental migration where although they live in one location, especially if their circumstances are difficult, there's this long, they, they have this longing to live elsewhere. And the way they do that is through the internet, through watching movies or uh, like, uh, you know, like admiring things that are foreign, sometimes when uh, clothes that are foreign, and well, not sometimes, in a lot of instances doing that. And so more and more as these things happen, they begin to think, act like, you know, somebody, let's say, living elsewhere, America, Europe, um, and we know how much clout those um, continents or, or countries pull 
in, in terms of uh, influencing culture. So I think the factors that are influencing those, and you know, just the just the explosion of the of the internet and social media, and now people finding means. Now look at this: we're doing this on um, on on Zoom, right? And I've been having like meetings upon meetings on Zoom and all other similar you know platforms. So with that, now we're, I think we're just going to have that, even if we return to some form of normalcy after the coronavirus, I think this thing is going to continue and it creates more opportunities mm -hmm. to have this sort of mental migration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And it goes both ways, actually, as a matter of fact. Um, I, I teach uh, literature and, and uh, Nollywood, and it's amazing how many non-Nigerians, and especially Americans and Europeans, are sort of, you know, have their imaginaries shaped by this explosion of images from Nigeria that people are actually beginning to take. I mean, if you if you're only on, the, on Facebook or one of those social media, you see that there are some uh, memes that are from Nollywood and <laughs> and everybody just embraces them in ways that no, great point. Really, yeah. Great point. I mean, I think it creates the opportunity, right, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> to have the reverse. For, for a long time, it's been going one way. Yeah. But I think this creates the opportunity uh, mm -hmm. for say Africa to influence the world a little bit more too. So there, yeah. that's a great point. Yeah, of course, there's always the question of unequal exchange because <laughs> how much information you can consume depends on your broadband and, or, or your ability to acquire some kind of data. But it's actually quite amazing that there are people use uh, WhatsApp more these days than email <laughs> because yeah. it's available in a particular kind of mode. So that's uh, quite uh, fascinating. Now, there's a very there's a question that I wanted to pose to CV specifically. Uh, I mean, and it's quite fascinating because I saw it, like, basically just reading your book, I was, I mean, there are several epigraphs there from Glisson, and there was one particular from Kadi Sila, the Senegalese writer. And I actually was wondering if you could say more about Kadi because uh, I, I suppose that the excerpt, uh, the epigraph is from uh, Le Jeu de mm -hmm. la Mer, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not aware that the book has been translated, and I think it would be interesting, uh, don't you think, uh, to say a few things about, about the book or about Kadi, who is now late. I mm -hmm. met her a few years ago, and she was such a fascinating person. You just cannot, <laughs> meeting her, you cannot forget her, you mm -hmm. know, very playful, very, uh, very self-aware. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think her work is that well known. She's well known in Senegal from what I can tell but maybe not so much outside, especially in comparison to uh, fellow Senegalese writers like Fatou Diom and Mach Diop. And so can you say something about this book or about your interest or with uh, Kadi so that people who don't know about her might know a bit more? Yes, uh, I think uh, Kadi Sila is mostly known for her, her work in uh, cinema. Yes, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she has, to my knowledge, only uh, one uh, novel out, mm -hmm. which is yes. Le Jeu de la Mer, that is not yet translated as far as I know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it is a fascinating uh, novel and I cannot figure out why uh, it is not better known than it is. Mm. It is a, a, a very, very sophisticated um, uh, plot uh, that uh, is a part uh, detective novel, <laughs> uh, but at the same time written in a, in a very poetic way with a, a broader metaphor that has to do with the game of Wu Wei. Um, uh, Wole, I think, uh, called, you know, the, the Mancala type of uh, type mm -hmm. of game mm -hmm. uh, in which um, uh, um, objects are moved from uh, one uh, spot to the next. Mm, this is a strategic game that is widely played throughout West Africa. Yeah. And um, and uh, she uses that as a metaphor to um, uh, to describe the quest that is a both a, a detective type of a quest, but at the same time a spiritual quest uh, of two uh, two, two two young uh, women, and. Um, it is absolutely fa fascinating. There is, I think, one uh, critical work um, on on that uh, on that novel, and that's about it. So it is it is un unfortunate, and it, it really would deserve uh, much more attention. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, I'm, um, I I know that uh, Kadisila passed away a few years ago, and yeah. uh, I was. Did really... you ever meet her? No, I never did. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. I mean, Eileen Julian. 
you know, Aline Julian, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she, she had a conference here in Indiana University some years ago mm-hmm. and brought her and uh, she had to do some errands. So I became her mm-hmm. assistant and mm-hmm. she was ordering mm-hmm. me around, but we got mm-hmm. along very well. Uh, yeah. Really, I was sad to hear that she passed away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, her movie, which is about a domestic worker in mm-hmm. Senegal, actually quite interesting because it sort of talks about some kind of, not, not so much intra-African migration, but even intra Senegal, sort of, you know, at least yeah, from the countryside to the city. Yeah, yeah a, a little bit like La, La Noire de by uh, Sam Ben Usman. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's quite, uh, quite, quite fascinating. And like, uh, I, I agree like, with you uh, that is the kind of work that needs to be uh, sort of translated. And who knows when that will be uh, the case. So, but thank you for, for doing that. So let me get back to, um, to, uh, to Ben to actually say a bit more about your position or your uh, career vocation as a moonlighting writer or moonlighting lawyer, whichever is your preference. You've written, uh, published four novels that were received. Uh, Perhaps there are other kinds of writing that you've done. I mean, as a lawyer, of course, you do some, you do a different kind of writing. And we have this a lot more these days. Uh, Usually in, in, I don't want to say in the West, but in more traditional idea of writers, the kind of writing that non-creative writers, uh, let me put it that professional like lawyers or doctors do, tends to be in certain genres like mysteries or uh, detective thriller, but you are doing really very, I mean, which is not to say that those kind of genres are not important, but you're doing what we call literary fiction. And so can you talk about these as a lawyer, you fully practicing lawyer, uh, and you do, you do uh, very serious fiction. And so can you talk about how you manage this for, from the point of view of someone whose yeah. life is also in this uh, area? Yeah. Uh, you're not just doing fiction because you want to, uh, I mean, make money or you want to sort of uh, fulfill, I mean, but you are doing, <laughs> you get with the point I'm making? <laughs> if it was <laughs> right, I get it. Money, if, if I course. wanted to make money, I wouldn't be writing fiction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, literary well, fiction. Getting my point. I get your point. No, okay. I, no, but I've written, I think, um, 14 books. I've actually written, no, 14 books so far. 14? So seven novels. Yeah, seven novels. Okay. Um, about four, I think, books of poetry and then some collections. Okay. And then I've edited, I recently edited a collection of short stories. And so your, your question is very good, is a great one. Why would a writer be writing this kind of, like poetry and, and fiction and all that? Right? And I think it's just passion. It's just what you love doing, right? It, it certainly doesn't pay the bills. And I've always said that, you know, I would write even if I didn't get published because I, I just enjoy writing. I, mm. I enjoy the process. I mean, I started as early as maybe even high school um, and I think, and, and did some writing, of course, it wasn't very good and it's not, it's not anything that I would publish now, but I, I think that I was inspired by a number of people, including my father and my, my mom, mother, my parents, right? My father was a great lover of literature. We always had books. I mean, I remember, although I couldn't read and understand it, picking up uh, Shrinker's season of Anomi, I was about 10 years old. And I, right. I started the first place. I'm like, wow, I need to wait a little bit <laughs> before I can, you know? But, you know, we had that environment, uh, encouraged to write. Uh, in school, we had some teachers that were great and encouraged writing and, you know, teaching, studying literature. So I I think I just developed that habit of, you know, or I just, the, 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 the love for literature. Um, and I always had in me that you know, it's something that I, I had to do, if you will. I mean, I, I don't know if I had much of a choice, um, but I also wanted to become a lawyer for different reasons, which I will not go into. So after law school, in fact, I wrote my first novel, I think my first year of, uh, of, of, of being a lawyer. And I would do it on weekends and at nights. Um, you know, I didn't have a family then, so I would devote most of my like spare time to writing. And I've always enjoyed the process. So it's um, some people might say that I moonlight as a lawyer, but <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, and maybe it's true. But you know, the lawyer is, the the law is also demanding, so you have to give it the attention. But it's just that love for literature, love for writing, and regardless, like I said, whether I win awards, whether I get published or not it's something that's that I just enjoy doing it and pe- pe- some people say play golf no mm. I don't play golf you know um so maybe my writing is my golf 
Okay. Yeah, and it's a very productive uh, uh, hobby, so to speak, if you want to put it uh, that way. So um, we are coming to the end of our uh, allotted time. So um, I just want to give both of you uh, the free hand to uh, share some general experience. I mean, again, from the sense I get of your work, we, I mean, we, we thematize this presentation around the question of migration, but that, that's not all you do. So can you speak, speak more? I mean, you are both writers. And so Ben, if you uh, would please maybe talk a bit more about your other kinds of writing that are not really about migration. And yes, absolutely. That, so, what? so let me conclude just basically by thanking okay. you all once mm. again, my co-presenter and you and the ALA. But, um, you know, just to set things in a little bit more context, and I think that uh, as a writer who's from Africa, um, that there's so much we can be writing about. Mm. You know, I think we've gotten the point. Initially, after independence, I think most African writers felt that they had to write about, like, the colonial period, pre-colonial, you had Achebe and all those people. But we, they, they've set the, you know, stage for us. They've sort of uh, given us this platform where now we are free to write about you know, anything we want to write about. I mean, if an African wants to write about, I don't know, the grass growing in Europe, they're free to do so. And I don't think they should be pigeonholed or should be expected to write be quiet in a certain way or about a certain um, topic. Why? Because again, you know, the, the ground has been covered, the foundation has been laid by our forebears. And so very much appreciated over that. But the African continent in and of itself has so much we can be talking about. And I'm hoping that, you know, as, as the, you know, in the future that we'll have the opportunity to share the African story told by Africans and that will be given a larger platform. And thanks to the internet, I think some of that is happening, but hopefully we can continue to do that. And in my own writing, um, I just see issues as they come and I just try to address them. So I've dealt with so many issues from like uh, relations uh, be between rich and poor in, in, in Ghana. Um, some of my writing has been, a lot of it has been on migration. Uh, some of it has just been on the political scene in Africa. You know, anything that I see that is worthy of comment, you know, I try to uh, give it my spin, if you will. Um, and my hope is that the African novel uh, for want of a better term, will grow in stature. And I see that happening and will gain in better recognition. And I think I see some of that happening, not only for those who are abroad, because most people are, um, who are recognized are those who are living outside of the continent. But you, know, you can walk into a bookshop in Ghana right now um, and you can pick up some great novels by you know, locally based um, writers. And I, I, I think that's the case for uh, most of the continent. So hopefully we're able to give uh, those writers also a bigger platform. Okay, thank you. Sylvie? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Oh, okay. Just share with us general ideas about your work beyond this uh, uh, poetry. I know you, you've written uh, a work about architecture in Sierra Leone. Can you talk a bit more about that? That's quite interesting. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah so uh, I have a double training in uh, classics. Uh, that was my first uh, master's in uh, in classics, so Fr French, uh, Greek, Latin, and um, uh, as soon as I was finished with that, I decided to switch to African history because I really wanted to understand my um, status in French society that had been somewhat challenged as a result of uh, the decolonization process. So. Mm. Um, I did that and uh, I decided to work on the question of the return to Africa and um, uh, as an example I used, um, you know, I worked on uh, Sierra Leone and the return of uh, people of African descent who had been um, uh, forcefully, uh, most of the time, sent back to Africa after uh, or even during the abolition of, uh, of slave trade. Uh, so it, it's a fascinating uh, story and I uh, continue to, to work on, I continue up to today to work uh, along those lines and uh, as an historian. Um, and, uh, and, you know, because, uh, because I read a lot and I didn't find in everything I read, uh, something that represented uh, some of my experience, I decided to uh, write. Uh, and I, I write, you know, um, 
because I'm obsessed uh, with uh, questions uh, that I really need to iron out. And as long as it's not done, I cannot, I cannot sleep. So, uh, so that's what I did with Lagoon Lagoon, which uh, revolves around métissage. And then, you know, as I was uh, pursuing my uh, reflection on this notion of mixed racial identity, I discovered that I had to go to uh, really to, to, to implement what, uh, what was right, which is uh, that races do not exist. So you cannot have anything like métissage which uh, supposes that you have two uh, pure entities at first that mixed uh, mm -hmm. uh, later on. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and, uh, and that uh, sort of coincide with uh, the moment in which all of a sudden uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, Métissage was uh, celebrated as uh, you know, something very aesthetically pleasing, um, the, the, everybody wanted to be a Métis and uh, <laughs> etc. And I found that very, very suspicious mm. um, because, um, uh, because it sort of hid uh, what, was at, uh, at, what was the precondition of this Métissage, mm. which was migration. Uh, so, then I write like, like Et Infini, which dealt with migration and, you know, the, the, the both the ordeal and, uh, and the, 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 the incredible accomplishment that migration represents. And uh, once that was done, then I continued on uh, something else that was um, also uh, one of my obsessions, uh, the language of gesture. So my last collection uh, is called Gesture, and um, this is a neologism. Uh, that attempts, you know, to sort of put together, you know, uh, a variety of uh, tableaus uh, in which uh, the gesture is at the is at the center. Uh, beyond that, you know, of course, I write uh, literary criticism. Uh, you know, a lot of things. Um, uh, my interests are growing <laughs> as uh, as I get older, which is uh, which is very problematic. But uh, I have to live with that. <laughs> We all have it. <laughs> anyway, that's fascinating. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Uh, really quite uh, uh, fascinating to hear you and hear your work. Uh, thank you for sharing this. We'll uh, bring this to an end and thank our audience for your responsiveness and for put, putting questions up to us. Uh, thank you. Please, um, we'll be back uh, early in the year and uh, hope you all have a good uh, weekend and excellent uh, break if you take one thank you ben uh we now withdraw or where we uh we we'll still we don't have to withdraw the honorary degree that I gave you <laughs> but uh just uh, <laughs> thank you very much and thank you cb thank have you nice thank weekend. you again thank all right you, thank ben. you really we've thank been all right nice meeting you thank all you right. again for the invitation okay take have care a, now everyone yeah. Bye -bye. have a good afternoon or good evening wherever you happen to be thank you Bye-bye.